So in another twenty-five years, who is going to grow food in this land? Because growing a crop is not a joke. If we handle this land right, we can provide food for the entire world. It's possible to do that. If you do this, farmers will be rich and well-to-do. All this debt that is there in the banks will not happen. One of the greatest achievements in this country, we have built businesses, we have built industries, we are going to the Mars, all this is wonderful, but the greatest achievement in this country is our poor illiterate farmer with little infrastructure, almost no technology, just with traditional knowledge, he is able to produce food for one billion people, this is the greatest achievement. But right now we are pushing the farmer to a place where you know, Thousands of them are committing suicide. You… if you want, you go about and ask, how many of the farmers want their children to go into farming? You will see it's less than fifteen percent. So in another twenty-five years, who is going to grow food in this land? Because growing a crop is not a joke. Tomorrow morning, you can't go to the field and grow a crop. There is a traditional knowledge which is so valuable, because of a long history of agriculture in this country, it is in the DNA of the farmer that he knows how to take a crop out of soil. At one time, I, I used to farm. First time I went out farming, I just finished my graduation and I want to do farming as an entrepreneur <laughs> and I went to farm. I bought these very expensive seeds and they told me, you got to throw it. I hesitated. <laughs> If I throw it, what will happen? How to throw this? Just now I paid so much money and got this, now I'm supposed to just throw it like this and the birds are waiting all over, I can see that. It took some courage to throw it. But once you throw it, only if you throw it, it will sprout and come back as a crop. I always found raising the crop was just a wonderful experience. Harvesting was the most painful experience because the way I am made, I would like to let the rats eat and the wild boar eat and give it away to the labor and walk away. But I have a bloody banker who's loaned money to me. <laughs> you know, I have to <laughs> pay back <laughs> and there are the issues <laughs> So, I always found harvesting is the most bitter experience for me. I loved the crops growing up. Many times, uh, you know, early morning, 4.35 when it's just the sunlight is falling upon, just seeing these plants, the way they grow day by day, it, it's such an incredible experience. After I got into teaching and then I was spending all my money very rapidly traveling and organizing programs, so, about three and a half years, I think I lasted out my… my old savings and then it was all gone. So then I had to grow something to make a living. So I decided to grow cabbage. Cabbage was doing great in the market and then I thought I'll grow cabbage because my farm was too far away and uh, it was little remote and I had a lot of wild boar in the area. If I put cabbage, they will feast. <laughs> so I decided to… I asked my friend and he gave me a few acres where he had the facility. He said, you do it in my farm, he had a home there. So I went and stayed on this. It's a seventy-day crop preparation and harvesting everything. Ninety days I gave myself and I said, I'll grow a crop, I'll make enough money so that another one, two years I can go on. So I went and sat there and uh, I've spent all my money, so I'm really stingy. I… even if I have to ride back home, I'm thinking of the gas, so I'm trying to make some simple meal there and survive. And I don't want to spend on the labor, so I'm physically working on the farm. So these uh, things, you know, like cabbage is a very hybrid cabbage, expensive seeds there. So we grow it in a tray first, 
inside the house. Then they all come up like this, then we take each one of them and transplant them. So I don't want to give it to any labor because if they just do this, each one of them costs money. So I sit there and if you put it in the day, the survival rate will be low. So evening after sunset, I will sit down and work till 1 a.m. Planting, planting, planting with a torchlight. It has to be in a straight line, so put a rope to try a tie a string and… So did all this back-breaking work and uh, then these things grow very fast. In about twelve, fifteen days, they're forming tiny little cabbages. This is the month of November and Mysore is most of the time misty and foggy in the mornings. Morning mist and sunlight, I just sit there, I want to see the first light when it falls on these cabbages. It's the most incredible scene, you know. It's like almost you're delivering ten thousand babies. <laughs> it feels like that, each one of them just every day, every day they're getting bigger. And I sit up in the morning so that uh, one thing I like to watch them, another thing I don't want somebody to eat them up. <laughs> so I had such an incredible experience growing them. Then the harvest came. The cabbage is all sized up like that, nice and uh, I thought, I'm counting money in my head. Though it was such a beautiful experience to grow the cabbage, when it… when the time to harvest came, the market, the vegetable prices crashed, it became twenty-five paisa per kilogram. Twenty-five paisa means it's a quarter of a rupee. One rupee means one forty-fifth of a dollar. One cabbage is weighing about one and a half kilograms, sometimes two kilograms, it's twenty-five paisa. It is not even worth harvesting and loading it on the truck because it doesn't even pay for the truck, doesn't even pay for the transport. So uh, I sat there and as the cabbages grew, uh, because I was living there and so I ate some cabbages. <laughs> Everyday cabbage <laughs> and uh, my father was going crazy. He's left a successful business and, you know, <laughs> sitting and growing cabbages in somebody else's farm, not even in my own land. I had enough land, but because too much wild boar near my land, I went to this particular place to grow and it was closer to the city. And it was not worth it. Then one day I just saw they've ripened fully and still the market prices are no good, taking it to the market. So I just told the villagers, uh, come and take per family five, five cabbages, take it home and eat it. But still there is plenty. So I just left the cattle, said, okay, go and eat it, enjoy. I saw the cattle was so happy in their life, they had not eaten anything so juicy in their life. They were chomp, 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 they went. Then I counted the money backwards. <laughs> so I just let the cows eat my cabbages <laughs> Then uh, I started looking what is it that's uh, wrong with this whole process. The land is fantastic. In that part of Karnataka where I am s south of uh, Mysore, you know, southwest of Mysore, people still live badly. It's such a fertile land, you can do anything with it, but still people still live badly because it's completely rain-fed and there's no proper practices and it's… I mean, to so disorganized. If you make a good crop, there is no price. If you make a bad crop, when the price is good, it's a bad crop. It's… you know, it's alternating like this, between bad crop and good price and good price and good crop and bad price is a regular situation in the farming community. Right now, one reason why farming is not succeeding is, soil is weak, so water is scarce. Another thing is, scale is too small to make it successful. The average land holding is one hectare, that means two and a quarter acres per family is what we have. 
at this level of holding, whatever you do is going to be waste. Everybody is under loan, okay? Some... some seventy-eight percent of Tamil Nadu's farmers are under debt. Because... I, I'll just tell you an example. A young farmer in our region, it's very fertile region. He has three and a half acres. So I meet him and ask him, what are you doing for your water? What's your water source? He says he has put nine bore wells. In three and a half acres, he's put nine bore wells. Because there are bore well companies which will come and promise, if you put it here, more water will come, if you put it there, more water will come. Everybody is hitting bore wells and bore wells. In three and a half acres, maybe there is one or two sources or maybe there is no source of water. Because the scale is so small, everybody is putting a fence, everybody has a bore well, everybody has an electric connection, this is not going to work. We need the scale, otherwise it will not work. Does it mean to say we have to take their land? No, for this we have worked out a system. I don't want to go into all the details in this, but this is what Rally for Rivers was about, how to integrate irrigation and marketing for the farmer so that his life can change. Now, one more big thing is, see India, the latitudinal spread that you have from Kanyakumari to Himalayas, twelve months of the year you can crop. There are very few nations where you can grow crops twelve months of the year. From Kanyakumari to Himalayas, you can grow literally almost anything you want in the world. If we handle this land right, we can provide food for the entire world. It's possible to do that. And this is the only nation, this is the only nation where sixty-five to seventy percent of the population knows how to do this magic of transforming mud into food. It is not a small thing. We could use that knowledge, we could use that capability, or we could make them destitute and come to cities and live in slums without any dignity, without any life to live, without any productivity, getting into crime or other kinds of things because they have no other option. So this needs to be addressed. So one of the things is, we have converted literally over 69,670 farmers in Tamil Nadu from regular farming to what is called as agroforestry. Their incomes have gone up five to ten times in a matter of eight to ten years. This is what... this is what we are calling as the Kaveri calling for the Kaveri belt... Uh, Kaveri uh, basin area. Because if you do this, we want to convert one-third of the Kaveri basin into agroforestry. If you do this, the forty-six percent depletion that's happened in the river waters will come back. River will flow once again, farmers will be rich and well-to-do, all this debt that is there in the banks will not happen because farmer will be rich by his own resource. I want all of you who are here today, if you are a concerned citizen of this country, in some way please participate in Kaveri Calling. So right now, uh, to assist the farmer to shift to agroforestry, there are a few things to happen. One thing is the saplings, large-scale development of saplings. We are looking at in twelve years to plant 242 crore trees, that is 2.42 billion trees. This is not like we are going to go and physically plant everything. This will be done on farmer's land by them, but we have to support it. So, we have about thirty-two nurseries spread across Tamil Nadu. So, we have planted over thirty-five million trees in the last uh, eighteen years, all on our own steam. Now this needs to scale up big time, so we have clear-cut plans how to multiply this. Today there's tissue culture, we have all the technologies, everything, you know, we've assimilated all these things properly. Now to act, we are looking at taking in all the aspects. It costs about forty-two rupees per sapling, not a very big cost. So, you don't have to plant just one. This has to be done in a planned way, we must execute this, otherwise uh, this
this nation is not… is sitting on too many problems and soon too many possibilities also. But to convert problems into possibilities, every citizen has to stand up and do what needs to be done.